So hello everyone, we're back on my energy project today. And the topic of today's video is monitoring how I measure my power consumption. These guys right here are a big part of it. After I did all the work to replace this electrical panel for the last video, I didn't take the time to hook these back up because I was going on vacation. I got back from vacation, didn't work on it, so that's what I'm working on today. So here is the power meter I use. It is a Brultech Green Eye Monitor. So this guy has 32 channels of real power measurement. That's actual watts, not just volts and amps separately. He's got a voltage sensor input that I plug in wall brick to that outlet there. And I've got all the current transformers for all the circuits that measure the consumption of every single circuit in my house. Or at least they used to measure every single circuit until I added the second panel and I added the EV chargers and that kind of stuff. So today I'm going to reorganize a bit. I'm just going to be measuring circuits out of this panel today. And so that should be about 30 circuits on this guy here. So it's perfect. So come along with me on this venture. So before I get too far along, I'm going to take the cover off this panel. All of the transformers are installed as they were before. So I have to take out the ones that aren't connected to anything. They're just kind of sitting in the bottom of the box. So essentially how this works, I got all these little tiny transformers here and you pass the wire that goes out to the circuit through the little transformer. This little transformer is going to have a magnetic core and it's going to have some wires wrapped around the secondary, which come out this bundle here. So essentially when current passes through the circuit, so it's passing through the transformer, generates an electric field that induces a magnetic field in the core, which then induces a electric field in the secondary, which is a sense wire. It's much, much smaller than the current flowing to the primary, of course, but it's small enough we can measure it. So these transformers are either listed as like volts per amp or amps per amp, milliamps per amp. So I don't actually remember what type these are. I actually have some of both, I think, but this board has some different connectors on it for voltage type or current type. They call them type A and type B current transformers. In my case, none of these circuits are gonna be back feeding. So if I wire any of them backwards, my numbers are backwards, I just flip it in software. If you're back feeding, like a solar input or something, you probably wanna be careful that you get the polarity correct. So you're aware of what direction is positive in the transformer and what wires hook up correctly to the monitor. Okay, so I got all the current sense wires done. I have 30 of them. So I have two channels unused on this guy, which is fine. This guy here, I could start monitoring. There's only four circuits in this panel up here. This is the sub feed to the other panel. So most people, when they set up a meter, they're like, well, I guess I could monitor my main and then I like a couple other circuits, but I took a different approach. I said, I wanna monitor absolutely everything. So I need a current transformer on every wire, every breaker. And as soon as I do that, I don't need any big ones anymore because I just need a current transformer for each load, however big that is. And I don't care about the main because I can just add them all up. So this is the 60 amp sub feed breaker that feeds that panel. So I don't need to monitor this one because I already have every single circuit in this panel monitor. I can just add them all up. The four up here is the EVSC car charger in the garage the car charger on the pedestal, the air conditioner, and the oven. So the oven is 120-240 split, so it would need two current transformers. The charger on the pedestal is two wires, so it would only need one. The air conditioner is also two wires, so it just need one. The garage would only need one, but I actually ran a neutral anyway, so it has a neutral and I probably should run two separate transformers. But anyway, I think I need to get another monitor for this panel separately because this one gets fed by the generator and this one doesn't. And so I'd like to be able to monitor the voltage on both panels separately. So this thing only has one voltage monitor, which is comes from this. So it's a 12 volt AC transformer brick. So I can plug it in right here and find where to tuck the wiring. Basically this plugs into a port on here and this is how this measures voltage. It doesn't use this for powering itself. It actually has a separate five volt input. And that's why I bought this as a PoE splitter. So it takes power over ethernet from my switch, splits that out into five volts for the device itself and ethernet for the device itself. And I've gotten uh, 12 volts from the transformer that it uses to measure voltage. The kit actually comes with a transformer to power the unit itself and a separate one to measure voltage. And I found that when the power goes out, this thing disconnects, which obviously makes sense because it's powered by AC power. So I instead decided to power it by PoE. So I can know for certain the power has gone out because the voltage measurement drops to zero, but the unit doesn't disconnect. Um, they have a couple different models of this. So ultimately the monitor itself has a serial port that it outputs data regularly. And that's fine. So you can get some modules that send that data different places. So they have an ethernet module that's just like binding the serial port to a TCP socket. It's like a 
low-level device, and they also have an XB module. And I decided to go with the Wi-Fi module, even though I want wired Ethernet, because the Wi-Fi module converts the byte stream that comes out of this into JSON. So the Wi-Fi module is a bit more advanced than the bare Ethernet one. It can, you can give it like a URL, and it'll do like an HTTP request every five seconds with a new data. And that's really easy. Or you could query it um, to get the data periodically if you want. So Home Assistant has an integration that does that. It queries the API to get the JSON. Um, I've actually been using the push approach for five years now with um, Node-RED. So Node-RED has an API endpoint that this pushes to. When that endpoint gets hit, it processes everything in Node-RED. Um, I'm getting rid of my Node-RED automations though because I'm moving everything to Home Assistant. So it's part of this rewiring. Now I gotta get this PoE splitter off the case, get it stuck in here. So that's what I got going. So I need another monitor for the other panel, probably. Um, some of these things actually can monitor themselves. So I believe both of the EV chargers have Wi-Fi support. One of them I've been using for a while with Wi-Fi support is an open EVSC. The other one is a wall box. I think it has Wi-Fi too. The air conditioner obviously doesn't, neither does the oven. So I have current transformers I could use for those. I could wire them down here, but um, I think that's a future project. Now everything's tucked back away in this little box, hooked up to the network, and I can work on the software side. So for software, I installed this guy here, Hacks Green Eye Monitor. There's actually already a Green Eye Monitor plugin in Home Assistant, but this is the beta version of it. So it just looks like this, it's custom integration. So I went through and meticulously labeled all my circuits, so I have stuff like this. For each one, I get power in watts, current in amps, and energy. Energy is what actually comes from the monitor. So you can see it'll spike up when you use power. The integration then calculates this power, which is really useful. So from this whole list of circuits here, I then created meter main, which is the sum of all the contributing parts. You can see here, I'm actually not using all that much power. So this is a quite low number here. Now, obviously if I hired a professional to install something like a generator or a solar system, they would probably look at it and say, well, you have a 200 amp service, you're gonna need like a 8 kilowatt, 12 kilowatt inverter, something pretty big like that. For a generator, they'd probably say like 10 kilowatts. It's probably a minimum for them. But looking at this, a 2 kilowatt rating with like a 3 kilowatt surge, we could probably keep our power within that during a grid down situation for quite a long time, quite happily. Maybe a 4 kilowatt inverter, that'd be perfectly adequate. One nuance to that though is the phase spread. So I am in North America, we do use 120, 240 volt split phase power. This does not accurately show which power is on which phase. I guess it could go through all the circuits and tag which phase they're in, add up two separate totals for the phase one, phase two, add that up to meter main, but I didn't do that. So I don't know what the phase imbalance is. I know in particular, the dishwasher and the microwave share a 20 amp circuit. This is not a good thing because they can draw more than 20 amps together and often do, not for very long. So that alone would cause greater than two kilowatts on one phase, which is probably gonna cause a huge phase imbalance for like a three or four kilowatt inverter. Might not be able to handle that. But anyway, I got this number here. And then I also added a track that keeps track of my peak rates here. So you can see this is how much I pay during night. That's how much I pay during the day. So this is kind of a schematic diagram of what's going on here. So power comes in from my utility company, hits my main disconnect here in this panel where I have a bus bar, where I connect big things like the cars. So then at the bottom of this panel, I have this breaker, which subfeeds this cable over into the other panel. And these breakers all have meters that I added today. They're actually just regular circuit breakers just like these. I just drew them with the meter because they have meters also. And that goes out to all of my loads in the house. So by measuring every single circuit in this panel and adding it up, I essentially have a total number for how much power is flowing over the orange wire from the sub feed into the sub panel. So because I put all this work in to have this second sub panel with the, in the graphic, the orange wire feeding it, I can now essentially cut that orange wire and add an inverter or a battery system there to power everything in the second panel. That obviously won't include the car chargers, the air conditioner, but that's okay, that's my intent. So I really wanna find an inverter that can splice directly in right here and has like a 60 amp transfer capability because this is a 60 amp sub feed and that's perfectly adequate for the amount of load I have here, because all the big loads are obviously in the other panel. Um, but inverters don't seem to like to do that. So I've been researching, as one does, and essentially I found like three different types of systems I could buy. So the first type of system would be something like an EcoFlow or an Anchor. 
This is a portable battery, portable, they're really heavy, but a portable battery bank. Now some of these large models, the large Anchor, the large EcoFlow Delta Pro, Delta Ultra, whatever, they have quite a lot of power capability and they could easily handle the load that I need to put on this. Now what they don't have is they're portable, so they're not gonna be hardwired in. Now these companies all make some sort of automatic transfer panel where you can plug some big proprietary cable in from their transfer panel into their battery. Then I'm tied to using their battery, which is fine. I'm intending on leaving this with the house, obviously. It's part of the house. But it just seems kind of weird to me as a portable system to have a proprietary connector. I guess there's no good connectorized way to do this. Um, I mean, the real connectorized way to do this would be using like IEC um, these, these connectors. We don't use them in North America though. All, all of our connectors are kind of awful. So I can see why they use their own connector design but I don't like it. The second thing I've seen, there's a lot of home energy storage systems. Now these are mostly things like the Tesla Powerwall, and I'll just call them Tesla Powerwall clones. The downside to a lot of these is how they wire in means they don't act as a UPS. So the big problem I have is with flickers, not with long outages. I mean, I guess I have a problem with both, but for long outages, I can plug in the truck. And so because I can plug in the truck, I don't care about the long duration stuff designing this system. I care about the short-term UPS capability. So to handle grid down, what most of these do is they don't have like a 200 amp interrupting capacity. So the main feed that comes into the house in my case is 200 amps. That's really common in North America. I know people in Europe are gonna be absolutely weirded out by that, but it's 200 amps because we use such a low voltage and because we don't care about efficiency here. So anyway, when the grid goes down, the inverter has to isolate the power from the main. It cannot back feed. And so two ways to do this are to use a grid transfer relay or like an isolation relay. So the way Tesla does this with their power wall is the power wall is wired into a circuit on the panel. It's coming into my drawing here. I would add a new circuit breaker down here and run this off to the Tesla battery. But because it's just a circuit on the panel and it's back feeding into the panel from the battery, it has to cut off power at the top at the meter. So they need to be able to get rid of that wire when the power goes down so they can back feed into this whole system. And so they do that with a second box that has a 200 amp relay. Obviously the 200 amp relay takes some time to click, but also it's not part of the unit itself, it's remote. So the unit itself has to detect that the power went down, then open that relay, cut off all the power to the house, then it can start back feeding it to island. But it can't be feeding that back onto the grid. So essentially what a lot of UPSs do, if they're capable of sustaining the load on battery, at the slightest hint of a power outage, they can isolate themselves from the grid and just power the whole load, and that's fine but the Tesla Powerwall can't really do that because it's not sized to handle a 200 amp load. So that's why they have to wait for the grid to go down, isolate, come back. And a lot of solutions are similarly based. So the third option I have is to use like a 48 volt solar inverter with 48 volt server rack lithium batteries, not necessarily server rack, but 48 volt stuff. And so 48 volts is kind of the highest DC voltage that's relatively safe to work with. Um, DC arc faults are a big problem, even down to much lower voltages than AC arc faults because AC arc faults will eventually be opened by the AC sine wave and DC ones never will be. So anyway, there are some hybrid inverters such as the ones I put on the screen here. And these are essentially designed to take AC in, DC to the battery, DC in from solar also usually, and AC out and manage all of this power transfer with some high voltage DC bus internally. They're probably running at 350 volts because that's the like rectified line voltage of 240 volt AC. So they have some essentially high voltage capacitors inside that are charging to 350 volts. They're able to rectify and invert AC power to and from their DC bus. They're able to convert 48 volts from the battery up or down to their bus in whatever direction they need. And they're very configurable for how they transfer power. That's what I would like to do, but those obviously cost money. And so I reached out to some companies that have these and one of them offered to work with me, but then they were unable to because they have an exclusivity deal with another company in the US. So that's where I'm at right now. Uh, if anyone has any suggestions on designs, I'd be very open to that. So I essentially haven't bought any equipment. I haven't done any more design work past this. As we're going into the fall season, the outages I'm having have gone down dramatically. I haven't had one over a month now, which is amazing because I had 37 of them so far this year, uh, which is a lot. So anyway, I don't plan on updating for a little while for this project. It probably won't be until early next year that I do another update on the energy system but I have monitoring now in Home Assistant for my power monitor. It's really great so I can properly size my system. I don't need to spend a lot of money oversizing it. I know exactly what my loads are, which is really nice to have. I know exactly what circuits I can turn off to reduce the load and how much impact that'll be. And honestly, even though I have like 37 circuits in the panel, 
I have 31, sorry, 31 circuits in the panel. Um, for most of them have such a tiny load in the modern day that they easily could have been like three or four circuits total. So anyway, if you like this stuff, I have a Discord server link down below for that. Um, if you want to give me a tip or sponsor this project or anything, feel free to reach out to me by email. I have a Kofi down below if you want to give me a tip personally. I really appreciate that. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.